Watching News Cafe on the Soro News Channel, and this is part two of our special one on one interview with Secretary Ramon Jimenez Jr. Secretary, thank you for coming over and talking to us. Thank you for having me. Local tourism, Secretary, is this our bread and butter today? Yes, it is, in fact, the foundation of, uh, of uh, Philippine tourism uh, because, well, first of all, part of the buy in of the Filipino public is they've got to see the country themselves. Okay. Uh, okay. Something which they uh, didn't really do a lot of before. There was a, uh, especially as you went up the economic ladder, there was a uh, predisposition to travel abroad. I think all forms of travel are good because uh, even travel abroad, when you think about it, because the more sophisticated the traveler the Filipino becomes, the higher his standards become and therefore the higher our own local standards uh, okay. become. So uh, that, that notwithstanding, you know, the sophisticated Filipino travel, traveler has actually decided to rediscover his own country. Hence you are seeing the growth of all classes of uh, travel there, there are five-star hotels mm -hmm. where uh, locals stay, even in places like Bohol mm -hmm. and Davao and Zamboanga and uh, and Iloilo and Bacolod. No? So these are these are very important developments. Domestic tourism is the uh, bedrock. It is the continuity. You know, during uh, certain seasons during what we call the off-season for international travel, mm -hmm. it is, you know, counter-cyclical because that's when our guys start to travel. Domestic so travel. So it's perfect. What about places like, I remember when I was young, we used to go to Matabungkay and my parents would bring us to Matabungkay uh, on a weekend. And somewhere along the way, it lost its charm. Now, well, I'm beach, you know? Yes. Uh, the, it became, the sand disappeared and, are these places being redeveloped, or, or are they, are well, they finding it, new markets? In, in fact, uh, let's begin with uh, the province. No? Uh -huh. Batangas is now the focus of their own, created by the provincial government and the local governments, mm -hmm. their own tourism development plan. They have a roadmap that they worked on together with the Department of Tourism, working with the Department of Public Works. Mm -hmm so that we are able to identify exactly what these areas are that will be slated for development. So, to uh, answer it very simply, in the next two years, Batangas will in fact be a very major destination if it isn't already now. Now, some of the actual locations may change. Okay. You're, you're going to see a lot of acceleration of development in terms of new coastal areas like uh, Lian, mm -hmm. where Anilao is, and uh, Nasugbu and Kalatagan. The Nasugbu developments are very significant and very upmarket. Kalatagan has very popular sites, and Anilao, of course, has very specialized diving, diving etc. And some argue one of the best dive sites in the world. And uh, the areas around Tagaytay, for example, will grow very rapidly because. Uh, the DPWH and the DOT are working together with the provincial government to complete what is known as the Ta'al Circumferential Road. Mm 
Mm -hmm. It will actually allow you to drive all the way around the lake. The lake. And, uh, and, and of course, pass through the towns mm -hmm. that, that are there. This is something uh, that would not have been possible if not for the influx of tourists. Now, uh, Batangas is what? Maximum of two hours away from Manila. Right. And the fact of the matter is a very significant uh, number of tourists will still enter the country through Manila. Our ability to provide very significant, meaningful experiences within a day trip of Manila is a major source of income now and in the future. What about Metro Manila itself? Do people come to the Philippines just for Metro Manila? Yes. F they come here already for uh, very critical cultural uh, reasons. We even have short haul markets now because we are uh, part of what they call the concert circuit. Okay. So when there are uh, major uh, musical uh, events in, the, in Manila, they come. Uh, that's very important. The other thing people have not noticed is if you go around, you're going to see a lot of Southeast Asians shopping in Manila because we are considered a major shopping destination. Okay, that was, that was going to be my next question. In terms of shopping, uh, some Filipinos still think Hong Kong is shopping or Singapore is shopping or Kuala Lumpur is shopping. How do we compare? It depends what you're shopping for. Yeah. I think if you're thinking about crafts, uh, furniture, mm -hmm. uh, if you're thinking about fabric, for example, believe it or not, uh, exotic paper, you would have a very serious, uh, have to take a very serious look at Manila. If you're talking, say, about uh, eating, mm -hmm. we are described as one of the great undiscovered uh, secrets in culinary in this part of the world. I always say, you know, if we can't get the rest of the world to eat adobo, we will get the world mm -hmm. to eat something cooked by a Filipino. You see, again, once again, the key is not the food itself, it's the people. We probably have some of the most inventive, most accomplished, and in some cases, the most highly uh, prized chefs in the world. Very few people are aware of that, that Filipinos are cooking everywhere in the world. Uh, and we intend to leverage that very soon. Filipinos love cooking. We all have our own version of adobo. Yes, and in that's the problem. That's why it's difficult to popularize <laughs> adobo, you see. So every time people talk to me about culinary, I say, don't start with adobo because <laughs> you will have to decide first which adobo we're going to What kind of adobo and who cooks it. Correct. But everybody loves adobo. Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a Filipino trait that goes into a lot of other things that we do in our lives. No? We're good at a lot of things. Are Filipinos starting to come home? Is yes. that part of your equation? Yes. Uh, and they are, in fact, uh, coming home in droves. The critical thing, th this is something we really appreciate uh, about our Kababayans, but the critical thing is this. I always tell them, look, they will always admire you for your brilliance, your hard work, your perseverance, etc. But if you're fun, they will follow you home. So uh, invite people. Invite people into your homes. Give them a glimpse of what it's like to reconnect with family, friends, etc. And they will, they will want to see the place that gave rise to that attitude. You, you see, somebody very recently, you know, there was this very popular blog uh, that said, why, why I love the Philippines. And, and somewhere there, this, uh, this uh, foreigner says, you know, in the West, our hands are full, but our hearts are empty. Mm. And yes. the reason he loved the Philippines, which is probably why, why uh, a lot of people fall in love with the Philippines, is our definition of fun has nothing to do with how much money you have. You know, I'm sure it uh, assuages a lot of uh, discomforts, but <laughs> the spirit of Filipino fun has got a lot to do with what really matters. And uh, that is probably what uh, will cause a lot of people to travel. You know? 
again, it's as much the people as the place. If you're looking at uh, places like, for example, Mindanao, Mindanao has a, has a PR problem. Mm -hmm. How do you solve a problem like Mindanao? Well, first of all, like the Philippine brand, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. We've got to begin talking about what's good in Mindanao. Because no matter what anyone says, there is far more good taking place in Mindanao, a building in Mindanao, than anything else. But once you leave your image up to just, forgive me, the news. Media. Yeah. Yes. Then, then you're not building anything. Notice that the Philippine brand image, for example, today is a lot more durable as a tourism brand mm -hmm. than it was before. It is what they call in marketing terms a self-sealing tire. There will always be uh, a nail on the road. Mm -hmm. The question is whether you have a cultivated brand image that can withstand that. As anyone who reads the Philippine news will know, we have been visited by problems uh, right. in the past few weeks, in the past few months, etc. The positive tourism brand is still there. Before, we never really attended to that. And uh, I submit Mindanao has got to get its act together and we're determined to help them there to make sure that the brand image is propagated. How are we going to start? Um, before the end of this year, Davao, for example, Cagayan de Oro, other places, hopefully Zambales, if they can mm -hmm. manage it, will participate in international festivals already. When you go to the Philippine Pavilion, mm -hmm. in London, for example, at the World Travel Mart, you're not going to see a pavilion that's just marked Philippines. You're going to see parts of the pavilion that are branded uh, Mindanao, Zambales, etc. And the reason for that is we've got to begin to propagate these names because these are sub-brands to the Philippines. Notice, for example, that Boracay is a brand on right. its own. Right. And therefore, it is as durable as brand Philippines. And some people even argue maybe even more so. You never did that for Davao before. We have an opportunity to do that. These are things that uh, only happen because, like I said at the top of the program, we're beginning to see tourism as an industry now. It's mm -hmm. a business and we've got to support it. And places like up north, the Cordilleras. What's going on with the Cordilleras? Baguio, for example. Baguio, there are three roads up, going up. Uh, very limited space when you get there. Uh, before, there was nothing to do but eat and sleep. Yes. What's going on in Baguio, well, the Cordilleras? Okay. Well, what's going on in Baguio is uh, very few people know, first of all, when the president formed the Boracay Redevelopment Program, which is now going to be responsible for reorganizing everything, taking down uh, uh, structures, temporary or permanent, that violate certain environmental mm -hmm. uh, conditions, etc. When he formed the task force, he actually formed another task force called the Baguio Redevelopment Task Force. And uh, obviously, I'm part of both task forces. <laughs> and our challenges for Baguio are different and in a certain sense more difficult because the problems are more, uh, more entrenched, mm -hmm. uh, older, shall we say. And uh, it will now require some very serious urban redevelopment. Uh, but it is not without uh, a solution, we believe. Mm -hmm. We have problems of uh, pollution, Right. Uh, congestion in certain residential areas yeah. and of course accessibility mm -hmm. now when you talk about the Cordilleras that's uh, it's an even bigger problem but we actually have more immediate solutions because the CAR probably gets a very healthy percentage now of tourism uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. um, we are determined to shorten the ride to uh, places like Banawe and Sagada. Yeah. Uh, 
there are certain routes, for example, that will take you up there mm -hmm. from Poro Point in less than two hours. Okay. And These are new we are, routes. We are determined. Barrier. Yes. Okay. We're determined to uh, we're determined to complete that. It will take about two years to do that, and then of course there is the redevelopment of the routes already leading to Baguio, mm -hmm. and to uh, extending outside of Baguio to new places. In, in Banaue, for example, when the first time I went to Banaue, the terraces were beautiful. Uh, if you go to Banaue now and you stop by the roadside, you can't see the terraces. Mm -hmm. There are buildings end to end. You have to go through all a maze of buildings and you come out the other end of the maze of buildings and then you see the terrace and then when you see the terraces, they're, they're not as pristine as they were 10 years ago. Yes. Well. Uh, they are over 2,500 years old. Right. Okay, so older than the pyramids right. and Banawi Rice Terraces. So it is now the focus of a rebuilding plan. And, uh, you know, as is my problem, depending on the site, it involves more or fewer or more government agencies. In the case of the Banawi Rice Terraces, it has, because it is a living agricultural site. Right. It involves the Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. and not just the DOT. So we're working with them now. Our great fortune in Banawe is that there is a thriving volunteer force you know, that is helping us reconstruct very significant areas. And if, uh, sorry, you know, I didn't bring the pictures, but there are huge areas now that have been rebuilt, if you will, or repaired. Okay, those that were touted before as being endangered have actually been repaired because it is possible to do now. However, you know, it is no different from trying to rebuild the pyramids, believe me, because it is gigantic. So right. it will probably uh, take much take more than one term to fix it, but we will. Um, okay, Secretary, we'll just go yes. to a short break. Okay. We'll take a short break. News Cafe will return after these reminders. We're still watching News Cafe and the Solar News Channel, and we're still joined by DOT Secretary Ramon Jimenez Jr. Secretary, thanks for your time. Thanks for joining us. There's so much, there's so much, <laughs> you're gonna spread yourself too thin. Uh, well, the, the, the key is activating or enabling the local governments. This is the key. And the reason why that is uh, very important is it is the only way to make sure that it is sustainable. If the people on the ground are not the ones actually running it, then there's a very distinct possibility that they will also not be the ones benefiting from it. And if they aren't benefiting from it, you're not going to be able to do it for very long. How are they taking it? Oh, well. Do they see it? I think to be very frank, it varies from area to area. Mm -hmm. Some areas are actually more uh, predisposed to doing it than others. Those who unfortunately have been focused on other things like, uh, like mining mm -hmm. or logging or, uh, you know, or shall we say less, uh, less productive pursuits, mm -hmm. to put it politely, you know, are, are not doing that well. And uh, in fact, uh, introducing tourism is a very painful exercise for them. Mm -hmm. Those who have actually seen the possibilities are the ones who are most active. I, I take, for example, an area like Cebu, where Governor Chato is very focused on, on uh, tourism. He's very focused on ecology. Mm -hmm. And in fact, is very focused on the idea that they will, they will always be popular not only for their beaches, but for their agri-tourism uh, orientation. They are doing very, very well. You know, these, these are uh, people who are turning their rivers into touristic sites. 
the Lobok River, the Abatan River mm -hmm. tours, etc., are just incredible projects, and we are going to help them do that now. The key is the people on the ground. And uh, I cannot overstate that because this is not a game of just uh, getting an investor to develop a province. The people stand back and watch it all happens. happen. That's, that's, that's not what we expect. Are we doing something that's sustainable? Not sustainable? Or that, that's that sustainable? is sustainable? Oh, yes. Yes. Like I said, that is, for example, uh, the focus. Mm -hmm. The Abatan River project is, in fact, uh, something in the offing that will involve the Department of Tourism, the Department of Agriculture, the province of Bohol, the people and the tribes around the Abatan River. In other words, the riverine cultures, as they call them. Yeah. You know, we will convert, in effect, or transform farms, not not merely into just productive agricultural sites, but in participative tourism sites. For people to learn things like, uh, do you know that, for, just as an example, do you know that about 70% of the world, 70% of the population of the world has never actually seen a coconut? That's what true. we take for granted, you know, we were talking to an Australian one time, and he fell off his chair because he never realized that the coconut has water inside. <laughs> he thought, you know, it collected rain or something like that. The, these things are actually things we have taken for granted. Right. And that people will in fact travel for an experience that is focused on just tourism. Or on, on agricultural tourism mm -hmm. rather. And uh, it's not as if we, we invented it. You know, for example, that people travel to see a vineyard. Right. People travel to see uh, apple orchards. Right. You know, and, uh, and we you were have... telling me about a rice train that grows in Banawe only. Yes, yes. The Banawe rice, if we mm. can call it that, is unique uh, in the Philippines and in the world. And uh, we should propagate that, okay? Now, talk about rice. We have unique rice everywhere. Very few people are aware that we have a place in near Naga, in Camarines, called Pecuaria, the Pecuaria Farms, okay. which actually grows purely organic rice, or what I like to call uh, miracle rice, because it is probably healthier than anything you can cook. Mm -hmm. There is actually an organic rice farm there with packaging, with exhibits, with guides, etc. And, uh, you know, we haven't really opened it up to the world yet. Well, you're the repository of all this knowledge now, the DOT. <laughs> yes. And how does, how does the, all this knowledge help you in supporting the It's More Fun in the Philippines? How do you use it in the campaign? First of all, it allows us to be more competitive. You see, when you say tour package, that means somebody somewhere, and I'm part of that team, mm -hmm prepares a package that plans your vacation from the time you arrive in the Philippines to the time you leave. So if you said, I want to see Manila and I want to see uh, this incredible place called Karamoan or, or uh, you know, Gota Beach, etc., mm -hmm. then I would say, well, somewhere there you're going, to, you're going to go to an organic rice farm and you're going to be cooked, uh, we're going to cook uh, miracle rice for you and this will lengthen your lifespan, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> this is all, nobody actually did some serious packaging. I mean, not nobody, but serious packaging for right. a mass volume market. Now we're going to have to do that. Just as an example, for Manila alone, we are busy developing two packages or what we call the perfect visit to Manila. Okay. The DOT is at the forefront of identifying in very precise terms what a tour of Manila will be so that we can gather the infrastructure around those specific sites. To Are make these it packages perfect. done? No, not yet. Not it's yet? Going to involve, but do you have an idea what it's going to It's going to involve like? a lot of managing, believe me, but we will do it. You know what you want? Yes. We already know what the itinerary is. But it has to be a perfect visit to Manila. You go in, we plan your next three days, and you leave. 
and hopefully when you leave, you've got no more money. How many areas have you been to, Secretary? Have you been to all the provinces of this country? No, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I've been to all the provinces. There are just too many. Too many. But uh, let's put it this way: I'm I'm in a plane almost uh, every week. <laughs> oh yes, every week. Yes, easily. Yeah. What's your favorite place? Top three. <laughs> I've answered this Will question you get in before. Trouble? <laughs> Not really. Okay. I've answered top three. my top three uh, favorite places to go are Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. <laughs> cheating. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. Okay. Favorite beach. Favorite beach. Well, you know, strictly kind. speaking, you don't have to name a beach. Favorite kind of beach. What do you look for when you go to a beach? I like party beaches. Oh, you Is like that party an beaches? Enough? Okay. On, only because you know, uh, my work uh, becomes a whole lot easier when I'm able to observe more than just the. Uh, I'm. I have to look at the beach differently from most people. Mm -hmm. You know. So wherever I can go and uh, where I can observe, right. uh, anthropologically, if you will. <laughs> you know, it sounds so so uh, difficult but it's not you know you're really just having a beer watching people yes it's a that's fun it's a professional form of cheese <laughs> that's fine where's our money going to come from how are we going to reach 40 million or 50 million tourists a year well first of all like i said the national budget is is uh, in support of tourism so part of it's going to come from there a lot of it is going to come from private initiatives. Mm -hmm. We are, I'm very proud to say that I'm probably, I'm invited every month to some kind of business investment forum now. Something which never happened before. Uh, and uh, that's, that's a very, very critical sign right there. The money, uh, you know, uh, for want of a more sophisticated term, is going to come from the uh, whole notion that nobody wants to miss the sweet spot that the Philippines has finally found itself in. When are we going to see 50 million? 50 million tourists. Tourists yeah. in the Philippines? Well, long after I'm dead, I think. But, <laughs> that but we, will, we will get there. We will get there. Re remember, in 2012, one billion people crossed borders for, for touristic travel. That's how many travelers there were. If we get even just a percentage of that, right. you know, we'd be pretty close to that number you want. But I'm so glad you're not my boss. <laughs> well, it's looking good. And uh, thank, you. thank you for the job you've done for this country. Thank you. Secretary Manimanos, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today with the Secretary. And join us again next week for another 360-degree look at the most important issues right here on News Cafe on the new channel.